our study, our focus on the book of Genesis, and then uh, next week we will go into the book of Exodus. And so, if you have the handout in front of you, if you don't have it, there are copies over there on the t- on the table because I want you to uh, make sure that you you follow what we're doing. And so, let me read the um, introduction just to um, help us uh, situate our study so far over the past few weeks uh, and months. Tonight, we wrap up Joseph's story and the book of Genesis and see how God's plan all along was to redeem his people through Jacob's favorite son. That is, Joseph was about to make a sense of the suffering that he had endured and his brothers were about to experience the beauty of forgiveness. So those are the two we're going to look at. That kind of, uh, you know, suffering that obviously uh, uh, was perpetrated or was brought upon him by his brothers, his own family, and of course, you know, the gift of forgiveness that we're going to learn today that Joseph actually uh, kind of um, offered, offered them through the help of, of, of God's uh, uh, blessing to Joseph. Um, and, through, and through Joseph and his brothers' um, uh, reunion, God was about to preserve his people. Joseph's suffering was painful. The brother's sin was evil. But God used the brother's evil for God's greater plan of providing salvation from the famine and to reveal God's purposes. God also reveals to us that he is a God who can do anything, even to override evil with good. Isn't that awesome? Even when we think that evil seem to kind of win and uh, obviously um, uh, seem to carry the day, God is still there working his plans and purposes through that. In the same way, God used the evil injustice of those who crucified the son Jesus to bring about his master plan of providing salvation from sin and death. Tonight's study is really interesting and also fascinating. As I kind of prepared it and I was trying to read it myself, it's, it offers us some challenges, but also some really deep, profound insights into how God works out his own plans and also tremendous encouragement to us about you know, not allowing the evil that we go through to somehow uh, force us to do things that you know, we shouldn't do as Christians. And so on that note, let me welcome our Facebook friends. And uh, we are going to look at Genesis chapter 42. <clears throat> and if you have your Bible, please just turn to Genesis 42. And we're going to read from verse 1 to verse 24. It's a beautiful story, and I thought it would be better for us to just read rather than me summarizing the whole thing there. So anybody who finds it, Genesis 42, just go through that for us. If you're tired, somebody can kind of, you know, carry uh, on from where you, li- you know, live up. So, Genesis 42, 1 to 24. Anybody? Now, when Jacob learned that there was grain in Egypt, he said to his sons, why do you look at me? Or look at one another. Mm. He said, I've heard that there is grain in Egypt. Get down there and buy the grain for us that we may not Die, but live. Right. So ten, so ten of Jacob, uh, Joseph's brethren, went to buy grain in Egypt. But Benjamin, Joseph's full brother, Jacob, did not send with his brothers, for he said, lest perhaps some harm or injury should befall him. So the sons of Israel came to buy grain among those who came, for there was hunger. <clears throat> and general lack of food in the land of Canaan. Mm. Now Joseph was the governor over the land, and he it was who sold to all the people of the land, and Joseph's half brother came and bowed themselves down before him with their faces to the ground. Okay, now do you see something going on here? They came and they bowed down. Remember the dream? So make sure you underline this if it's your Bible, they will pay attention to that. Now they came. Something that was foreshadowed is really now 
coming to you, you know. Go ahead. I just wanted to point that out. Well, whoever wants to go on. Yeah, verse 7. As soon as Joseph saw his brothers, he recognized them, but he pretended to be a stranger and spoke harshly to them. Mm -hmm. Where do you come from? He asked. <laughs> from the land of Canaan, they replied, to buy food. Although Joseph recognized his brothers, they did not recognize him. Isn't that interesting? Yes. Yeah. So that's another thing that you need to pay attention to, you know. So here we go. Yes, go ahead, George. That's interesting. He didn't have his coat of many colors. <laughs> so maybe. <laughs> oh, you know this when you're blinded by sin, you don't even see God's glory. You don't even see your family. Sin is no good. Mm -hmm. I have an explanation. Just to interrupt for a second. It says there uh, when Joseph recognized his, you know, jo Joseph recognized his brothers, but he didn't recognize the mother. Says perhaps as many as twenty years had yeah, passed. Yeah, and that's correct. It's twenty years. Brothers last saw Joseph. Yeah. they never would have suspected that the powerful Egyptian rulers would be before there. Them. Yeah, that's that's the whole point. Their brother. Yeah, that's the whole point that's because why. they never thought about it that <laughs> Joseph, who was sold to these people, and now they even thought the guy was dead yeah. by this time, yeah. and then a Hebrew to be. That governor in Egypt, that was also unthinkable. So you see, the way God works, it's, it blows our minds away. It's just beyond us. How would Joseph really be the governor in Egypt? Second to the Pharaoh, if you like. I mean, they never thought. I mean, these are peasants. These are farmers, you know, they, uh, they never live in a city. And now here's Joseph. So that was another reason why probably they couldn't recognize him. Yes, go ahead. <laughs> then he remembered his dreams about them and said to them, You are spies. You come <laughs> to see where our land is unprotected. No, my lord, they answered. The have come to buy food. We are all the sons of one man, your servants. are honest men, not spies. Mm. No, he said to them, You have come to see where our land is unprotected. But they replied, Your servants. We're 12 brothers. Now, interesting. Now, they begin to tell the story. And Joseph is listening. I, I love this. Yeah, go ahead. Don't let me destroy it. <laughs> servants were 12 brothers, the sons of one man, who lives in the land of Canaan. The youngest is now with our father, and one is no more. Ah. Oh, and one is no more, referring to who? <laughs> Joseph. <laughs> and right in front of them was Joseph. So, another irony there. It's really interesting. Go ahead. <laughs> Joseph said to them, It is just as I told you, you are spies, and this is how you will be tested. As surely as Pharaoh lives, Whoa. you will not leave this place unless your youngest brother comes here. Ah, that's getting very, very sticky here now. Send one of your numbers to get your brother. The rest of you will be kept in prison so that your words may be tested to see if you are telling the truth. <laughs> if you are not, then as surely as Pharaoh lives, you are spies. He put them all in custody <laughs> for three days. <laughs> Have mercy, Lord. In the cooler for three days. <laughs> yeah. Go ahead, please. On the third day, Joseph said to them, Do this, and you will live. For I fear God. If you are honest men, let one of your brothers stay here in prison while the rest of you go and take grain back to your starving households. Mm. But you must bring your youngest brother to me so that your words may be verified and that you may not die. This they proceeded to do. No, to up to 24. 20, okay. They said to one another, Surely we're being punished because of our brother. Ah, so there we go. See, now they're beginning to remember. Right. Mm -hmm. So, with Joseph doing all of this to them, now they, <clears throat> boy, what have we gotten ourselves into? And surely, and in antiquity, that was how it was reasoned that if you actually get into a situation like this, then it means it's something that you did or your parents or your kind of you know ancestors or something that happened that's why you're being punished for that so surely guys maybe because of what we did to joseph that's why we're getting out you know we're in this situation go ahead <laughs> let's see what happens so he said surely we're being punished because of our brother we saw how distressed he was when he pleaded with us for his life huh. but we would not listen wow that's why this distress has come upon us hmm. Reuben replied, Didn't I tell you not to sin against uh, the Lord? Now they, 
Five mm-hmm. kind of among themselves now. Now they beginning to reckoning. Day of reckoning has come now. So they're now beginning to kind of think through that act which they did. But you wouldn't listen. Mm-hmm. Now we must give an accounting for his blood. <laughs> they did not realize that Joseph could understand them since he was using an interpreter. Hmm. He turned away from them and began to weep. But then came back and spoke to them again. He had Simeon taken from them and bound before their eyes. Wow. Now, because we don't, we don't have time to read through the whole of the story to the end of Genesis, let me just offer you a brief summary and then we will jump to the other part. Uh, so up to this point, you notice that uh, Simeon, from the last uh, verse which we, we, we just read, Simeon is actually held captive here. And then he tells them to go back and bring their younger brother, Benjamin. And so the story is really going to be very interesting from this point. Uh, and as we will see, uh, it's, it's not going to go down well with Jacob. Because remember, he sent the ten minus Joseph, who is already somewhere, Benjamin. Daddy wouldn't let him you know, leave home. Because his brother is gone, and that's the last one. And so, you know, there's no way Jacob will let you know, Benjamin go you know, you know, from home. But it's really interesting. What I want you to pay attention to here is the, the emotional toll that this is taking, not only on the brothers, but also on Joseph. And you notice in the verse, verse 24, he turned away from them and began to weep. But then came back and spoke to them again. And then he had, you can see this, Joseph is really struggling here. So verse 24, and then if we jump to um, verse, um, we, go, we go all the way to um, verse, you know, uh, chapter 43. And again, let me just jump because I want you to see, I want to point a few things here. Chapter 43, and look at um, verse 29 to verse 30. Let me read that. Chapter 43 of Genesis, the same, you know, Genesis. Chapter 43, verse 29 to verse 30. As he looked about, he saw his brother Benjamin. So at this point, they brought Benjamin. They went, and before we get there, there were all kinds of things that actually took place. But I just want to emphasize the emotional toll that all this took on Joseph and suddenly also on the brothers. And so here we go. As he looked about and saw his brother Benjamin, his own mother's son. That's the son of um, um, you know, Rachel. Rachel. So Rachel is um, Joseph and Benjamin. And then the rest, Leah, as we know. And so here we go. He asked, is this your youngest brother? The one you told me about and he said God be gracious to you my son deeply moved at the sight of his brother this is 20 years 20 years Joseph hurried out and looked for a place to weep he went into his private room and wept there and so there's some things that are actually taking place here that I want you to, um, you know. And then when we go to um, chapter 45, Genesis 45, again, uh, um, let me read from verse 1 to verse 3. Genesis 45, verses 1 to 3. So at this point, um, you know, uh, something has also occurred and they're telling him more about what's going on in their family and, and Judah is pleading that he shouldn't keep Joseph because if, if he kept Joseph, I mean uh, uh, Benjamin, uh, you know, daddy, uh, dad Jacob will die. There's no way they can even you know, return. And so he's pleading. And so here's Joseph coming. So in chapter 45, let me read from 1 to 3. Then Joseph could no longer control himself before all his attendants and he cried out, have everyone have everyone leave my presence so there was no one with joseph when he made himself known to his brothers and he wept out he wept so loudly that the egyptians heard him and and pharaoh's household heard about it joseph said to his brothers i am joseph and look at the first question that comes out 
Is my father still alive? Man, you get goosebumps here. <laughs> yeah, you know, something really begins to happen, you know. Is my dad still alive? But his brothers were not able to answer because they were terrified in his presence. Just think about it. Everything we've right. done wrong is coming back to haunt us. Yes. This is a very moving piece of story in all of scripture. And again, if you go home and you just have some time, please just read from chapter 42 all the way to chapter 50. And you will see some of the intricate kind of designs and things that are going on in this story. And so with that, let's just look at this story in, in a way that I think it's so relevant for our own Christian experience and Christian uh, you know, you know, life and work. There's something that I put there, the first point there, foreshadowing. You know, we see how this kind of way of writing to really convey a very strong point. The brothers thought that they had gotten rid of Joseph and his dreams by kind of getting, you know, selling him into slavery. Now they come back and lo and behold, they bow down. And, you know, and Joseph actually says something that is also interesting. In fact, um, when we go back to um, chapter 44, <laughs> when he put this special cup, uh, you know, when he, they filled their sacks or their bags, he put his special cup in Benjamin's sack. And so when they went and they kind of uh, were tired and they stopped, they looked in their sacks and they found this special cup. And meanwhile, Joseph had sent a steward to, to, you know, after them and said, you've stolen something from my home. And they found this in Benjamin's sack. So Benjamin had to be taken. And this is where Judah says, please, just take me. And let, 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 let this, you know, this junior, please, I'm here, just take me. You can see there's something actually taking place. And then Joseph says this. Look at verse 14, Genesis 44, verses 14 and 15. Joseph was still in the house when Judah and his brothers came in. And they threw themselves to the ground before him. Now listen to what Joseph says. Joseph said to them, What is it that you have done? Don't you know that a man like me can find things out by divination? That I knew that some of you, somebody had taken my special cup. <laughs> now you know what's going on. The dreamer. He's a dreamer. And so really, what he said is true in a way. You know, he's a dreamer. And now, all these things that I told you, Joseph may be saying them, you know, they're coming true. And so, it's really interesting to see how this story actually plays out. But, in all of this, God was at work doing something. You remember the um, phrase that we used last time, redemptive reversal. When God reverses things that happen in our lives for his own redemptive purposes. Sometimes things happen in our lives and we think that that is it. I'm done. There is no way out. But God turns things around and God uses that situation that we think it's so chaotic. It's bad. There's no light at the end of the tunnel and God changes it to our advantage to our salvation. This whole thing about the farming, this whole thing about Joseph being sold to the Ishmaelites and the Ishmaelites selling you know, him to the, you know, uh, in Egypt, all this was actually something that God had his hand in. Even though God didn't plan that they should do that, but God used that evil to turn you know, into good, to bring something good out of that. And as I read this story, like Joseph, we may find ourselves in situations that sometimes may even seem hopeless. But we can know that as followers of Christ, we should never despair. We should have hope. Because, you know, in Romans chapter 8 and verse 28, which we all know very well. Let me turn to that. You have it on your hand out there. Romans 8 and verse 28. And we know this because um, it's just important for us to check this out and, and read it. In Romans 8, rest, exactly, you know that. Romans 8, 28. And we know that all things God works for the good of those who love him. 
who have been called according to his purpose. The last part is important. According to his purpose. It's for God's purpose. And God's purpose is always to bring something good out of evil. In fact, in the book of, of Philippians chapter 1 and verse 21, we find something very similar. Again, let me read that to your hearing. In Philippians chapter 1 and verse 21, this is what, again, Paul uh, you know, writes you know, for us. Let me start from verse 19. Yes, I will continue to rejoice, for I know that through your prayers and God's provision of the Spirit of Jesus Christ, what has happened to me will turn out for my deliverance. I eagerly expect and hope that I will in no way be ashamed, but will have sufficient courage, so that now, as always, Christ will be exalted in my body, whether by life or by death. And here's verse 21. For to me, to live is Christ, and to, to die is gain. To live is Christ, and to die is gain. In other words, if my life is in the hands of the Almighty God, and whatever happens to me, I know God will turn that into a blessing. If we go back to Genesis chapter you know, 45, we find another interesting thing about how Joseph used this situation to somehow worked out some repentance brought his brothers to a point where they were able to see what they had done and go back into the data bank kind of remember when they sold him into slavery and and all the things that obviously uh, they never thought you know obviously they would see again and now joseph is the guy that they sold and he's the guy who becomes their redeemer when they meant evil God turned that evil into good. That's why the title of our study tonight is God overrides evil with good. And if we know that God can do that, then we as Christians need to be careful when we uh, get into situations like that. So again, let me summarize from chapter 43 all the way to uh, maybe chapter 50, uh, and then we see how the story actually goes on. In, in my point number two, as the farming intensified in the land of Canaan, in all the fertile crescent, which includes Egypt, North Africa, and then you know the, uh, the Middle East there, Jacob's family had to make a second trip to Egypt for two reasons. One, for more grain, and also to get Simeon back. Remember, Simeon is held there. Uh-huh. Okay. And so he's there. And so Joseph welcomed his brothers to a meal and of course he favored Benjamin in the, the kind of portions that he put in his uh, in his bag again he had their bags filled with grain along with their money he, he never took their money in the first case you know time they went there he put their money back and yet he gave them grain but it never occurred to them and if you read the story they were saying well man the man was so good when they went back home and they told their dad the man was so good that he didn't even charge us. He filled our bags and he blessed us and we just left. They didn't even think that, hmm, maybe something is going on here. It, it never occurred to them. So here we go. He then instructed his servant to place his personal cup in Benjamin's bag. And when they had left, he sent his steward after them. The cup was discovered in Benjamin's bag and the brothers returned to Joseph in grief and horror. Whoa, we are doomed. This man did us good, and look at what is going on now. In fact, Joseph then threatened to enslave Benjamin. This is where it gets really sticky. And then Judah steps in and intervened and pleaded and pleaded and pleaded with Joseph to imprison him instead of Benjamin because of what it would do to their father. To lose his youngest son. Joseph is gone. He couldn't afford to lose Benjamin. And now Simeon is also out there. So this is what Joseph would, wanted to see. To see if the brothers are genuinely repentant. If they really felt that they had done something wrong. And so Joseph then worked with his brothers to bring about their repentance. They thought about how they betrayed Joseph. 
and you know Judah actually began to do something. So let's go back and read what Judah says because I like what Judah actually said uh, to uh, you know to Joseph in chapter forty-four. And uh, let's start from verse sixteen. Let me read through this chapter forty-four, beginning at verse sixteen. What can we say to my Lord? Judah replied. What can we say? How can we prove our innocence? God has uncovered your servant's guilt. We are now my Lord's slaves. In other words, Joseph, we are your slaves. They didn't know it was Joseph, by the way. They say, my Lord. We ourselves and the one who was found to have the cup. But Joseph said, far be it from me to do such a thing. Only the man who was found to have the cup will become my slave, which is Benjamin. The rest of you, go back to your father in peace. Now here's Judah. Look at verse 18. Then Judah went up to him and said, Pardon your servant, my Lord. Let me speak a word to my Lord. So he's going to give this whole repertoire, if you like, whole catalog of something about the family and what happened. So here we go. Do not be angry with your servant, though you are equal to Pharaoh himself. My Lord asked his servants, Do you have a father or a brother? Trying to kind of play back what Joseph had told them earlier. Mm-hmm. And we answered, We have an aged father. And there is a young son born to him in his old age. His brother is dead. Standing there was Joseph. Still, they didn't recognize him. The brother is dead. The only one he has now is the youngest. And so here we go. And he is the only one of his mother's sons left. And his father loves him. Verse 21. Then you said to your servants, bring him down to me so I can see him for myself. And we said to my Lord, the boy cannot leave his father. If he leaves him, his father will die. But you told your servants, unless your youngest brother comes down to me, you will not see my face again. When we went back to your father, uh, to your servant, my, my father, we told him what my Lord had said. Then our father said, go back and buy a little more food. But we said, we cannot go down. Only if our youngest brother is with us, will we go. We cannot see the man's face unless our youngest brother is with us. Your servant, my Lord, said to us, you know that my wife bore me two sons. One of them went away from me, and I said, He has surely been torn to pieces, and I have not seen him since. If you take this one from me too, and harm comes to him, you will bring my gray head down to the grave in misery. Listen to this. So now, if the boy is not with us, When I go back to your servant, my father, and if my father, whose life is closely bound up with the boy's life, sees that the boy isn't there, he will die. Your servant will bring gray head of our father down to the grave in sorrow. Your servant guaranteed the boy's safety to my father. I said, if I do not bring him back to you, I will bear the blame before you. My father, all my life. Now then, please, let your servant remain here as my Lord's slave in the place of the boy. And let the boy return with his brothers. How can I go back to my father if the boy is not with me? No. Do not let the misery, do not let me see the misery that would come to my father. So this is the story. It's really very harrowing heart wrenching this is what we, we know, you know we're looking at and so you can see there seems to be some kind of repentance being worked through here the brothers are beginning to reflect and think over what they did to Joseph and Joseph played it in a nice way you know to really get them to that point and so we see here in this story that uh, a picture that emerges for me is the greater way God works to bring us to repentance of our sin. 
Joseph was very kind to his brothers. And that kindness did engender, did elicit some sort of repentance. You see, now he's telling, Judah is telling the whole story, you know, repeating what Joseph said and said, but, you know, we can't. And so we're so sorry. We're so sorry. Something that they didn't do when they sold Joseph into slavery. This is something that I want us to, you know, think about. What does this story say to you? What does this story say to you? Let's just read from verse 4 to verse 8 of Genesis 40, 45. Can somebody read from verse 4 to verse 8 of Genesis 45? Then Joseph could no longer control himself before hmm? all his attendants. Hmm? He cried out, Have everyone leave my presence. Right. So there was no one with Joseph when he made himself known to his brother. <clears throat> and he wept so loudly that the Egyptians heard him Pharaoh's household heard about it. Joseph said to his brothers, I am Joseph. Is my father still living? But his brothers were not able to answer him because they were terrified at his presence. Mm -hmm. And Joseph said to his brothers, Come close to me. Mm -hmm. When they had done so, he said, I am your brother Joseph, the one you sold in Let, Egypt. Just stop there. <sighs> Can you imagine looking them in the eye and telling them I am your brother Joseph the one you sold into slavery in Egypt can you speak to that yes. can you speak to that ah. what do you think was going on through in the, in the minds of the brothers Terror, guilt, shock. Can't believe it. Can't believe it. You know what I like about this whole story? Go ahead. I mean, it's a little bit aside. But Joseph, man, is he shrewd. These things he instigated, implemented, just to nail these guys. Yes. One little plan after the other. Uh, uh, yes. That is smart. Man, yes. He is shrewd. Very shrewd. <laughs> And only God could make that yeah, come, that you know, mean, because think about that? he I'm wanted them to think. He wanted them to think. <laughs> and it looks like it, it worked. And it worked. They, they, they were thinking. I mean, I mean, for Judah to kind of go through all of this and, uh, you know, for all the others to, to say, look, this has happened to us because of what we did to our brother. Something is beginning to kind of happen to them. Something is beginning to happen to them. You know, I just want you to let, again, your religious imagination stray a little bit. Sometimes, as Christians, we want very straight, simple answers to everything. But, you know, God works in mysterious ways, as we say, his wonders to perform. Look at how, the, you know, the way this story is going. The detours and all the twists and turns. And God is working through all of this. Look in your life. Can you look in your life and see the twists and turns? And sometimes you say... Man, why me, Lord? Can you see Joseph's story as maybe an encouragement to you and to me that God isn't finished with us yet, even when things are not going right? I want us to, do, to draw some encouragement from this story. But let's go on. Let's read up to verse 8, please, and see what's going on here. Very and now, emotional. And now, do not be distressed, and do not be angry with yourselves for selling me here. <laughs> Because it was to save lives that God sent me ahead of you. Ah, you see how he made this a redemptive story. Did you think that was the intention of the brothers when they sold him in the beginning? Did you think that was the intention, that it was meant to be redemptive? I don't think so. But you see, as you said, Dave, and I agree with you, this guy is really led by the Spirit here. God let you do this. He, want, he wanted the brothers to feel good. No, because at this point, I'm sure they're feeling so bad, terrified, and, you know, they don't even know what's going to happen. They're thinking, man, we are dead here. <laughs> and yet he comes here and says, hey, just take it. Don't be afraid. You didn't do this on your own. God made this happen so that you will be saved and I will be saved and our whole family will be saved. Think about it. Please, let's continue. Let's finish this. 
For two years now, there's been famine in the land. And for the next five years, there will be no plowing and reaping. Mm -hmm. But God sent me ahead of you to preserve for you a remnant on earth and to save your lives by the great deliverance. Okay. Now, if you didn't hear anything tonight, make verse 7 your memory verse. But God sent me ahead of you to preserve for you a remnant on earth and to save your lives by a great deliverance. A remnant. God always has a remnant. And you could be that remnant. You could be part of that remnant. And so in this story, Joseph is telling us that everything that happened was by God's providential design. Remember the three P's we talked about? God's power, God's providence, and what is the third one? And God's provision, we said God's you know, providence, God's power, and there was a three, there was another P. God's, well, God's protection is part of, you know, part, you know, part of that. God's providence, God's power, and God's Well, well, pro, you know, provision is actually the same as you know, providence. Oh. You know, you know, providence is you know part of um, you know God's God's provision. And so there, there are three pieces that we that we need to actually know from the story that we learned last week. God did you know the, the providence of God in that story. You know the, uh, that we learned about Joseph and how you know he found himself in you know in Egypt and all of that. That was God's providence, God's providential care in all of that. And then we also saw that in this, God's power was actually being made manifest. And of course, God's protection. And so these are important things that we need in our lives. The three Ps. God helps us. And uh, if you go home, you can actually you know, check on that. And so verse 8. So then, it was not you who sent me here, but God. He made me a father to Pharaoh, lord of his entire household, and ruler of all Egypt. And then he gives this last thing that we're going to uh, you know, you know, note. Now hurry back to my father and say to him, this is what your son Joseph says. God has made me lord of all Egypt. Come down to me. Don't delay. And the story keeps going. And then after he's done all of this, jump to verse 14. Another emotional uh, uh, embrace. Chapter, you know, the same chapter, you know, 45, verse 14. Then he threw his arms around his brothers, his brother Benjamin, and did what? Well, Wept. And Benjamin embraced him, weeping. Mm -hmm. And he kissed all his brothers and wept over them. Afterward, his brothers talked with him. God is good. God is good, ladies and gentlemen. God is good. Look at this story. You know, the more I read this story, and I want you, when you go home, just take time because I said I can, you know, go through the whole story with you. But if you read this story, it's something that helps us to see what God is doing. Because in the, in the final an analysis, when we get to Genesis chapter 50, uh, the last part of, uh, on your notes there, and we read from uh, verse uh, 15 to 21, you notice something actually, um, you know, takes place. Uh, Genesis chapter 50. Verses 15 to 21. Let me read through that quickly. Genesis, the last chapter of uh, Genesis. When Joseph's brothers saw that their father was dead, they said, What if Joseph holds a grudge against us and pays us back for all the wrongs we did to him? They still were not sure. But meanwhile, Joseph had forgiven them because he said this could have only happened, you know, through god's kind of um you know orchestration not you didn't do that so let's you know, finish the story here so they sent word to joseph saying your father left these instructions before he died this is what you are to say to joseph i ask you to forgive your brothers the sins and the wrongs they committed in treating you so badly now please forgive the sins of the servants of the god of your father when their message came to him joseph wept again. You know why he wept? He had forgiven them. But they were still not at the point to receive that you know, forgiveness. His brothers then came and threw themselves before him. Again, the foreshadowing. It's happening. We are your slaves, they said. 
But Joseph said to them, Don't be afraid. Am I in the place of God? You intended to harm me. Another verse I want you to kind of take with you tonight. But God intended it for good to accomplish what is now being done. The saving of many lives. Your life and my life are for the saving of many lives. So then don't be afraid. I will provide for you and your children. And he reassured them and spoke kindly to them. This is the story of Joseph. He was saving many Egyptian lives too. As well. Providing the food. As well. And in fact, the whole of Canaan, if you like. This is the story of redemptive reversal. So if you think that your life is all messed up and you think that I'm the only one uh, that God uh, is not doing anything about, remember the story of Joseph. This is a story that should give us pause, should give us goosebumps, but should give us hope and encouragement. Any comment, any question before we bring our time to a close? Anything that's done? I just want to say that the last verse you read right. said that he spoke kindly to them yeah. and 20 years before they couldn't speak kindly to them. Yeah. Yeah. In 1996, we went to Slovakia to teach a uh, two-week English Bible camp, and that, yeah. that uh, God has his remnants has reminded me of that little Baptist church right. in Slovakia that mm -hmm. all through the year communist rule right. they kept this church in. No, to remind them, yeah. yeah. And so you can read the last part there. Because of what God the Father had done through their sin and his suffering, Joseph understood that God had brought good from evil. Joseph kept his eyes on God and not on his circumstances or the people who had sinned against him. He did not hold his exalted position over his brothers or even nurse a grudge against them. He looked toward God, trusted God's plan for his life, and God brought salvation to his people through his suffering. Your life and my life is to bring salvation to others. May God help us to be faithful to our calling. Let's go to the Lord and pray. Gracious Lord, we thank you for tonight and we thank you for the story of Joseph and for the tremendous biblical lessons that these stories reveal to us. In all things, may we trust in your providential care and may we know that whatever the outcome, Lord, you can turn evil into good, even when we do it on purpose, because your ways are not our ways. And the story of Joseph, the story of Jesus Christ, all remind us that, Father, you are the God who holds this world in your hands. Help us to allow you to use our lives to bring salvation to others. All this we ask through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Amen. Thank you.